Hello everyone, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening. I am Asma Shindi, petroleum engineer graduated from American University of Ras al Khaimah. On behalf of Biopetro Arab Oil and Gas Academy and SPE Egypt section, I would like to welcome all of you to the last session of our short course, Field Development Geomechanics, presented by distinguished speaker, Dr. Hamid Surush. Before I present our speaker, I would like to remind you if you have any questions, please drop them in the Q&A box and keep the chat box professional. Now our speaker is Dr. Hamid Surush. He is an internationally recognized geomechanics expert with more than 25 years of experience in geomechanics applications. He has conducted or managed more than 250 consulting and research projects worldwide. Dr. Hamid is currently the CEO of PetroLearn LLC with the objective to apply learning from oil and gas to accelerate movement toward clean energy. Dr. Ha Dr. Hamid holds Bachelor in Mining Engineering, Masters in Rock Mechanics, and PhD in Petroleum Engineering from Curtin University in Australia. He has been selected as SPE Distinguished Lecturer in 2012, 2000, 2017, and 2020. Today's session is about uh, wellbore stability analysis. So please pay attention and welcome Dr. Hamid Surush. Dr. Hamid, the mic is yours. Uh, thank you, Asma, for the introduction. Uh, hello, everyone, and thank you for attending the, this last session of the reservoir. Uh, sorry, field development geomechanics course. Uh, so, people who attended in the in the previous sessions, we started with a, a session on on theories uh, with respect to uh, stresses, so the rock deformation, and rock failure, and then we moved to. Uh, geomechanical modeling with following a workflow that I introduce as a uh, kind of my best practice in the industry, I mean, for uh, geomechanical modeling. So through the workflow, we uh, started with rock property modeling with pore pressure prediction, and uh, we got into the stress modeling. And uh, the part of the stress modeling that uh, remains here is the maximum horizontal stress, uh, basically magnitude. We talk about the stress orientation, we talk about the vertical stress and minimum horizontal stress estimation. So uh, after uh, finishing with the geomechanical modeling, uh, uh, we will move to the wellbore stability and I will show you uh, how we typically do wellbore stability and uh, what are the values that <clears throat> wellbore stability bring into drilling. So uh, with respect to maximum horizontal stress magnitude is actually one of the most uh, complex part of geomechanical modeling because currently there is no uh, methodology available that can uh, directly measure uh, maximum horizontal stress, right? So uh, we have to kind of estimate or, uh, uh, you know, evaluate these parameters. Uh, and typically there, is, there, there are not many uh, information available to calibrate these uh, horizontal stress basically uh, profiles. So there are three methodologies uh, that I would like to discuss today here. And uh, these three methodologies all together uh, try to, to uh, constrain the, the range of uh, possible maximum horizontal stress uh, if we, we know all other stresses and pore pressure. Uh, so the first one is the use of uh, frictional faulting theory to basically come with a, a range of uh, possible uh, maximum horizontal stresses for a given vertical stress. It means in the, in the certain depth or in certain formation, uh, we would know what, what, what are the possible combinations of the minimum and maximum horizontal stress uh, within the uh, formation's subsurface. Uh, the other sources of information that basically helps us to, to more constrain the uh, magnitude of maximum horizontal stress are uh, existence of you know, drilling induced tensile fractures and uh, borehole breakouts. These, the, the two of these uh, features are related to uh, formation failure. Uh, one is in basically tensile, the other one due to compression. Uh, and these two features, if uh, they are seen uh, on image logs uh, in a well, they, they really help to better constrain the maximum horizontal stress. So let's uh, start with the frictional faulting theory. So the equation that you see here uh, basically relates the, the, the magnitude or the uh, amount of minimum and maximum horizontal stresses to the friction coefficient of the major fault and fractures in the, in the, in the region of, of focus. 
So if we solve, basically, if we draw uh, these equations on a piece of paper for three different stress regimes, I mean, normal, stroic sleep, and reverse stress regimes, you end up with uh, a polygon like this. So this polygon is for a given depth. So the SV is constant, but it shows that what is the relationship and possible combination of the SH max versus SH min. So it's a cross plot between the two horizontal stresses. Okay. So one side of the, the polygon is basically the, a line that shows SH max and SH min are equal. So you know that SH min can never be less than SH max, um, SH max cannot be less than SH min. So this part of the plot is basically has no physical meaning. Uh, so, and these lines, which basically uh, limit the, the polygons are coming from the equation of the uh, frictional faulting theory, right? So what does it mean? It means that if we have already defined the SV and uh, minimum horizontal stress plus pore pressure, of course, because pore pressure goes to these equations. And for example, and we have SH mean then, right? So for each SH mean, right, this polygon give us a range of possible maximum horizontal stresses, right? It might be very narrow, basically range, or like if, if uh, for example, the SH mean is 130, the range is quite narrow. But if it is around 70, you see that the range is quite big. So Esther's polygon basically only provide a range for a magnitude of the maximum horizontal stress. It does not provide accurate uh, information about the, uh, the magnitude, okay? Now, moving to the uh, second source of information, which are drilling-induced tensile fractures. Uh, drilling induced tensile fractures uh, form on the weldbore wall at 150, uh, 180 degree apart from each other. Basically, they are opposite each other on the weldbore wall, and they are due to hoop stress or uh, tangential stress sinusoid going below the tensile strength of the of the formation. Okay, so you remember the Kirsch equation that we explained before, and the sinusoid, which basically represents the the hoop stress around the well bore. So when the sinusoid, sinus, sinusoid passes the, the tensile strength, uh, then we will see these little features that uh, can be identified on image logs. So basically, if you don't have any image logs, you won't be able to do this type of analysis, right? So uh, this is the equation for the uh, tangential stress. And then the condition that I just mentioned, so uh, this basically term should be below the tensile strength of the material. Uh, if we just assume uh, tensile strength zero to be conservative, it gives us uh, uh, this equation to basically calculate the SH max. Uh, or you can, you can keep the T as well, the tensile strength if you want, if you, if you know the tensile strength of the material, so you can just uh, add it to this term. Uh, but as you see, these equations, if we solve it, so here we have SH mean, we have pore pressure, and we have the, uh, the mod weight that was used to drill this section, right? We can calculate a minimum possible SH max, right? Okay, so this just give us the minimum uh, value for SH max. So it, it means that SH max can, SH max can be actually uh, above uh, that number. But in combination with the polygon that you see here, if, for example, your SH mean is 60, so polygon is giving you a, 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 basically a range from 60 to 100 uh, megapascal. If your tensile strength equation, uh, basically the hoop stress equation gives you uh, a number here, which uh, telling us the, the minimum SH max is 80, then your range gets smaller. Now from instead of 60 to 100, your range is 80 to 100. So, as you see, tensile uh, fractures, drilling in induced tensile fractures only uh, can make the range of SH max smaller. So it's, it's helpful. It is better than the, the first approach. Now, <clears throat> if we have uh, borehole breakouts, you already know that borehole breakouts are the, the, the result of uh, formation failure, mainly shear failure of the rock formations 
And it happens because the mud weight is not really enough to, to support the rock formation. So they, they fail in shear and they basically, the, uh, the rock debris gets uh, uh, washed by the uh, fluid circulation. And you, you will see like enlargement zones that are uh, uh, located oppositely around the world, right? So these features, they have geometrically, they have uh, what we call it width of, uh, a width of the breakout, which is the opening. Typically, we use this angle to explain the uh, breakout width. And they have a depth that shows that, I mean, how uh, basically the failures don't uh, penetrate into the formation. So if we know these features and we know the uh, strength of the formation, there's a requirement for this analysis. And you, you know, work property modeling is, is a requirement for any, any type of geomechanical modeling. So the assumption is that we already have the strength uh, parameters of the, of the formation, including cohesion, friction angle, and UCS, right? So uh, this is the polygon that you are already familiar with that. Uh, the cross plot is, is again, SH max versus SH mean. And these contours show the uh, strength of the formations. For example, uh, if, if the formation strength is 120 megapascal, right? And we know that the minimum stress is 60, then you can basically get uh, a more accurate estimate of the SH max, right? So it basically guide us to go right to the point that we need. But you know that, you know, the, this lab measurements and, and the, um, uh, rock property uh, modeling based on logs, they are not 100% accurate. There are usually a, a range uh, uh, or uncertainty range around each number. So, but anyways, in, in any case, it, it very basically uh, pretty much narrow down the, the range of the SH max magnitude. Then uh, as you notice, image log is a, a very valuable uh, type of data to do maximum horizontal stress and stress orientation analysis. Uh, image logs can be uh, electrical, which basically are pad-based and you see some gaps in the, in the image. Uh, but if, if the image log is acoustic, then it has a full coverage of the World War wall. So you can easily identify the, uh, uh, not both breakouts and tensile uh, induced tensile fractures. The beauty of no uh, acoustic uh, uh, image log is that you can, if you calibrate the, uh, the data based on the distance from the center of the world, then you can basically visualize your well bore in 3D. Oh, with with uh, this set, we are uh, done with our geomechanical modeling. We have all the six uh, core components of a geomechanical model. Then we can uh, use this model for uh, wellbore stability modeling, for hydro, uh, hydraulic fracturing modeling, for uh, completion uh, optimization, for uh, sanding studies, uh, and also, I mean, in 3D for uh, reservoir performance analysis. <clears throat> Uh, as part of this course, we can only cover one application, which is one of the most important applications actually uh, of geomechanics in the oil and gas industry or any industry involved with drilling, including geothermal and uh, carbon storage. So uh, let's uh, see what wellbore stability or issues uh, are that we are trying to basically uh, prevent them. <clears throat> So when we drill a well, we basically pass through different type of formations. Some of these formations are strong, some others are uh, really weak, some of them are uh, friable, some are naturally fractured. Uh, some uh, physiochemically react to the, um, uh, to the drilling and to the drilling fluid. But overall, if we drill a well with a mud weight which is too low to support the rocks from failing. This failure can be in either in the, the form of uh, shear failure or compressional uh, failure. Uh, we might get uh, the borehole enlarged due to formations failing and then basically uh, creating an enlargement zone, right? In natural fractures, there might be actually rock wedges and pieces coming into the well. In friable sandstone, you will see 
production of the sand grains. In shales, uh, I mean, brittle shales, you typically see, I mean, extra cavings and cuttings uh, due to uh, failure of the formations. So this uh, type of basically problems are problems that are related to mechanical failure of the rock, uh, typically shear and com uh, compressive failure. Uh, and the result of them is uh, enlargement in the well, plus a lot of uh, uh, problems that happens during drilling. And I will show you a list of them in a, uh, in a few seconds. But there are also formations that have uh, non-mechanical reaction to the, uh, to the drilling, like salts or squeezing material. So they squeeze into the uh, wellbore and try to close the wellbore. So the, this wellbore issue is more with convergence rather than enlargement, right? And shales have kind of similar uh, basic reaction to drilling, but uh, the phenomena is, here is not squeezing, it's swelling. So if the if shale is, is exposed to water, uh, it basically the, it swells, the volume of uh, shale increases and try to close the well. Squeezing is, is, is kind of uh, vis viscoelastic flow. Uh, there's no change in the volume of the rock, but it's just the rock flowing into the, into the well, right? So all these uh, problems happen because, you know, a uh, wellbore uh, has not been supported enough by the, by the mud weight. So in wellbore stability anal analysis, we try to actually uh, come up with the minimum required mud weight, mud weight uh, to support the rock, okay? <clears throat> now, on the other side, if the uh, mud pressure is too high, we might either initiate a new fracture into the formation or reopen existing fractures. And this uh, basically process uh, uh, now result in what we call it loss circulation. So we lose the mud through these uh, fractures into the formation. And it's quite costly problem to, to stop it and uh, you know, uh, cure it. So uh, as you notice, the, the mud weight should be optimized, should be within a window, not to actually allow failure of the formation and not allow uh, breaking the formation. So, and on top of these uh, wellbore stability issues is issues that are related to the pore pressure. For example, if you drill with the mud weight uh, below pore pressure, you might get kicks, blowouts, and uh, in general, work uh, inflow of uh, fluid into the well, which is not really uh, wanted during drilling. So all these three sets of you know, issues uh, create a topic called wellbore instability or borehole instability. And the whole objective of this section is to understand how we can stop this. So typically these are all the parameters that uh, uh, kind of influence wellbore instability. Uh, some of these parameters are related to the rock and fluid, uh, rock, uh, like, you know, rock strength, uh, like uh, lithology types, uh, stiffness and compressibility of the formation, the, the thermal properties, natural fractures, swelling behavior of shale. Uh, some of the parameters are related to the boundary, uh, boundary conditions, like, uh, you know, stresses, uh, pore pressure, temperature, time. As you see, these parameters are not our, uh, under our control. So we call them uncontrollable factors. Uh, there are also far, uh, parameters related to wellbore fluid, like uh, uh, mud weight, like rheology of the mud, composition of the mud, uh, ECD, right, uh, circulation of the mud. And also some are related to mechanical uh, characteristics of the well, like the uh, whole trajectory, like uh, bit vibration, system vibration, the size of the hole. And as you already noticed, these are the factors that uh, we have under control. So basically in wellbore stability, we include the effect of all these parameters into, uh, into a study, but these are the parameters that we can control and optimize to avoid uh, any of those issues that I just explained. So uh, just to quickly show you what, uh, what we mean by uh, mud weight window. What you see on the screen right now is a traditional definition of a safe drilling mud weight window, right? Classically, people from old time, like uh, 70, 80 years ago, when they uh, were drilling and trying to minimize the available stability issues, risks related to uh, drilling, 
uh, they were using this type of model. So on, the, on one side of the model, uh, we have a pore pressure profile, right? And the other side is fracture pressure, okay? And the assumption is that if we drill with the mud weight in between these two limits, so we don't get the uh, kicks, blowouts, we don't get you know, lost circulation, so uh, the drilling is safe. But honestly, it's, it's a very uh, wrong concept and it's a big mistake to, to stick to this traditional uh, way of thinking about well -board stability. And the main reason is that there is one more line here, which is very, very important. And this is related to formations and how they react to the, uh, to the drilling. It's called wellbore collapse pressure, right? Wellbore uh, collapse pressure or collapse gradient is basically the minimum mud weight required to drill through the formation without the risk of, you know, formation getting failed, right? So it's, uh, it's the minimum mud weight we need to provide to avoid uh, collapsing the formation, right? Now, imagine we ignore this red line, we drill with this mud weight, uh, everything's gonna be okay, but it means that, that we are just lucky because, I mean, uh, we could potentially be drilling with this mud weight. So according to classic way of thinking, it's, it's also safe, but the fact is that it's not safe because if you drill with, uh, below the collapse gradient, uh, you will have uh, a lot of wellbore stability problems. It's the problem that I uh, just showed on the previous slide, right? So is this red line always above the pore pressure? The answer is no. If the rocks are competent or strong enough and don't need uh, our support, this red line can be potentially be below the pore pressure. And this is the only and only case that we can drill with the mud weight below Pore pressure in a very controlled well, well, uh, way. So we call this technology underbalanced drilling. And underbalanced drilling has several advantages uh, over you know, conventional drilling, uh, like you know, minimizing the uh, uh, damage to the reservoir because um, the mud weight is not too high to basically invade into the reservoir and create damage. You can drill faster because the drill, drill bit is working in a lower pressure environment. And specifically in tight uh, reservoirs like shale or tight sand or carbonate, uh, and specifically in the, the exploration phase, drilling under balance has the beauty of you know, producing gas or oil, hydrocarbon while you are drilling. So it's, it's a technique that lets you identify and, and detect the, uh, the actual reservoirs, right? This is why industry is really interested to, uh, to, to drill under balance. But as you notice, the, the first step to the condition to drill under balance is that collapse gradient be lower than the uh, pore pressure. Uh, th this is quite actually important slide. So I, I really want you guys to pay attention and remember the details because uh, it's, it's the base for you know, uh, safe drilling and wellbore stability, right? So there are formations that actually if rocks are really weak or they are heavily fractured, so in this type of formations, you know, uh, frac gradient can be pretty low. The, the collapse gradient can be uh, very high. So, and we end up with a very narrow uh, mud weight window, uh, which keeping the mud weight in between is, is really, really difficult sometimes. And sometimes there's actually no window because the rocks are just so weak to, that they, they collapse as soon as you drill into them, right? To have the best control on the uh, downhold pressure to uh, be able to drill uh, through this type of uh, you know, narrow windows, there are technologies out, out there called managed pressure drilling or control pressure drilling. Because with, with conventional drilling, it's really sometimes impossible to drill these sections. But MPD, CPD, there are, there are technologies that help us to, uh, to better control the, the mud pressure and, and be able to drill this challenging sections. Uh, we have, I mean, these sections in, in basically high uh, pore pressure zones, like very uh, high, you know, uh, over pressure zone, typically the, the windows are narrow because uh, the pore pressure pushes the, the collapse gradient uh, high and get, get higher to get close to the uh, fracture gradient. Uh, HPHT cases, typically we, we, are, we have this type of situation. But again, the, uh, as you see, geomechanics not only add this uh, red line to the traditional mud weight window, it also uh, helps us to, to select the best 
technology for drilling, right? So not only optimize our drilling mod, our drilling design, casing uh, shoes, uh, based on this type of analysis, it also helps us to select the right technology. <clears throat> So these are the typical uh, borehole stability issues. Uh, if you are reading drilling reports, like daily drilling reports, for example, and you uh, see any of these problems, like uh, pack offs, stock pipes, uh, stock tool, they are related to formation collapse. You know, borehole enlargement, uh, breakouts, uh, requirements for washouts, they're typically uh, related to the formation collapse. When the formation collapse, you get extra uh, cuttings and also cavings that come out of the, uh, the well. There's typically uh, excessive uh, requirement for tripping and rimming uh, because of the bad hole condition. Uh, if the mud weight is high, uh, typically you see loss circulation or total loss problems reported during drilling. Uh, loss of, you know, uh, equipment, uh, because when the formation collapse, basically they, they might uh, uh, pack your, your tools, uh, logging tools or your bit uh, in the well, so you cannot really recover that. Sometimes you need to do fishing, which is a very expensive uh, operation. Uh, sometimes, you know, the, the, the well board condition is so bad that you need to sidetrack the well. Right, because you cannot really drill anymore because of the formation collapse problem. Uh, bridge and obstruction or other terms that you, you will notice during drilling. Uh, and, you know, uh, one of the problems uh, when the wellbore gets enlarged is that the quality of the logs, log data would be poor. So sometimes, I mean, petrophysicists uh, have to uh, spend a lot of time and uh, improve this or correct this this data. Sometimes you cannot really recover and uh, get accurate, you know, uh, logs uh, in these intervals. So uh, you lose a valuable source of data because uh, of the bad borehole condition. And the last problem uh, due to borehole instability and well bore enlargement is that uh, typically when you calculate the uh, volume of cement to put the casing in. And you are not aware of the, the breakouts development around the well, well, well bore or washouts, the calculation of the cement is not really correct. So you do uh, you end ended up uh, you ends up you know uh, end up uh, injecting less cement as needed, and uh, the result would be low quality cement, which is a you know <clears throat> uh, is a big problem to the integrity of the well bore. Okay, so if you see any of these problems uh, reading a drilling report, these are signs of wellbore instability. So just a few examples. Uh, this one, uh, basically they drill through a formation, which is apparently you know, a weak formation. The formation collapsed because the mud weight was not enough. And it packed the basically drilling tool, drilling bit and the, the, the bottom hole assembly uh, somehow they couldn't actually get it back. So they call it stock pipe or the stock tool problem. You can uh, basically with increasing the torque and, and pressure, you, you can get the tool back, but it is a you know, time consuming operation actually too, uh, which, which delays the drilling project. Uh, the second problem is typically uh, with re-entry into the well, because you know, during drilling several times, we have to actually uh, trip back and, and uh, run into the well again. Uh, if there is an enlarged zone, right, due to uh, formation collapse, sometimes, you know, you lose the, <laughs> uh, the hole, actually. It's, it's really hard to find uh, where the bit should go to actually continue to really. And this is the example of th those uh, ledges and uh, obstruction that I uh, uh, mentioned in the last uh, slide. So yeah, this typically happens in very brittle and, you know, uh, elastic type of rock, stiff talk, uh, rocks. So these ledges uh, kind of uh, stock the tool sometimes and uh, it's hard to get the tool out of the hole. Now, uh, you already have seen this slide before, but let's review again to see what happens when we drill a well bore, right? And uh, remove the rock support from the, uh, uh, from the formations, right? And uh, in this case, uh, if, this is a vertical well, right? And so virgin stresses are basically the horizontal stresses, minimum and maximum stress. 
We don't see SV because the, the, the borehole is vertical. So when we drill a well and we try to support the rocks, uh, basically compensate for the removed uh, formation with the, with the mod uh, pressure, which is an uh, isostatic uh, uniform, basically type of uh, pressure applied to the well bore. And of course, it's very different from the initial uh, support to the rock, which was an, an isotropic, basically a stress field. Uh, stresses redistribute around the well bore somehow that the maximum compression goes to the orientation of the minimum stress and minimum compression or even tension uh, occur at the orientation of the minimum stress, right? So you remember that uh, breakout always uh, uh, form at the orientation of minimum stress in the vertical well, and then uh, drilling induced tensile fractures or hydraulic fractures always go uh, at the orientation of the maximum stress or perpendicular to the minimum stress, right? So, um, if we want to calculate, calculate the uh, hoop stress or tangential stress uh, at a point close to the well bore, right? Outside, basically, uh, before we get to the stress uh, version uh, area, the two main components that uh, are acting on any, basically, uh, element of the rock is the tangential stress, sigma theta, and uh, a radial stress which acts toward the center of the, the well and a shear component which is actually uh, tangent to the to the well bore wall okay but apart from the wall. Uh, the simplest um, solution for this type of basically uh, uh, problem was provided back in 1898 by by Kirsch right Kirsch solved these equations for uh, elastic, isotropic, homogeneous material in a you know, uh, plane which is uh, uh, in, in a plane strain condition, right? So it means that the, the strain doesn't happen actually outside this plane that you're looking at. Uh, right now, uh, and as you know, I mean, uh, back in 1819, there was no... Uh, science called rock mechanics. So these, these basically these equations were developed for any type of material, which is elastic and uh, homogeneous. Uh, right now we have uh, more complex solutions for elastoplastic material, for anisotropic materials, uh, for more complex basically geometries of the well bore uh, and so on. So, but uh, we are not going that direction because you don't want to see equations which are one, two page long, right? So as you see, uh, Kirsch actually provided the equation to calculate the radial, tangential, and uh, uh, shear stresses at any point around the well bore, right? Having SH mean, SH max for a vertical well again, uh, the radius of the well, uh, the distance, sorry, the A is the radius of the well, R is the distance from the well bore center, and theta is basically the angle to the maximum horizontal stress, right? So if you have these parameters, you can easily calculate at any point these three uh, stress parameters, which basically give you the, uh, the stress tensor, okay? Now, for well bore stability, uh, we really don't care about the stresses at this point. All we care is, is the stresses on the well bore wall. So to recalculate, and rewrite the, the, these equations for this point, all we need to do is to do, put R equivalent to A, right? And then the equations become as simple as this, right? So it's telling me that on the well bore wall, the radial stress is always equivalent to delta P, which is the mod weight minus pore pressure, okay? In this very simple way, simple basic condition. The tangential stress is sigma SH, basically uh, SH max plus SH mean minus two times the differential stress multiplied by cosinus of the two theta, which you know what angle is that, minus delta P, right? How much overbalance or underbalance you are, minus a, a you know, thermal stress component, which is basically important when there's a large uh, temperature difference between the 
the, the reeling fluid and the, the formation, right? It's typically an important uh, parameters when we are talking about high temperature uh, reservoirs, HPHD drilling, and geothermal uh, drilling, basically. Uh, apart from that, uh, we typically put zero and ignore it. And then the shear component uh, uh, becomes zero because basically we are in a free surface uh, point, so there's no shear uh, stress develop uh, between the, the f drilling fluid and the developer wall, okay? So uh, equations are basically very simple. And if you remember, if we basically draw this second equations for uh, tangential stress, it is a sinusoid, right? Going from the orientation of the maximum horizontal stress, which is zero, to 90 degree, uh, sorry, minimum to 90 degree, which is maximum, uh, and then uh, continue. So you go from a minimum to a maximum, minimum, again, maximum compression, right? Now, if you know the peak strength of your material or rock, right, and this maximum hoop stress basically exceeding that is where you get the breakouts because the weld board will still fail, right? On the other side, if this minimum hoop stress or tangential stress goes below the tensile strength of your formations, you develop those uh, drilling induced tensile fractures. These are not re really long fractures. Uh, they're typically very small. Uh, so they're, they're different from hydraulic fracturing, but uh, it's the same mechanism and the, the same uh, concept. Basically to, to frag the formation, what we, we need to do, we need to increase the uh, downhole pressure. By increasing downhole pressure, we are pushing the sinusoid down, right? So we are, take, we are artificially taking the sinusoid to the uh, basically uh, tensile failure, uh, okay? So, uh, so this is the whole concept behind wellbore stability. This is actually our mud weight window, right? So where we frag the formation, where we put the formation in risk of you no know, collapse. So all we need to do in wellbore stability study is to calculate the sinusoid, right? Compare it with the compressive strength and tensile strength of the, of the formation and see if uh, it stays within this range. If it does not, then we have to actually change our uh, drilling parameters to, to put it in between. So do we really need to have the whole sinusoid to do well with stability study? The, the answer is no. We just need to have the, the maximum and minimum hoop stresses, so even easier. So if we go to the previous uh, basically equation and put the theta angle zero and 90 degree, then we can calculate these two maximum and minimum, basically amounts, right? <clears throat> so these are typical uh, mod weight, basically image logs that we can see the breakouts on them. These are the breakouts, they are 180 apart. These little features are, as you know, are drilling induced tensile fractures. Uh, Uh, so now the question is that how we can calculate uh, the minimum mud weight uh, to avoid developing breakouts and the maximum mud weight that basically prevent uh, creating fractures on the valve wall, right? So I want to take you back to the Kirsch equations again, right? So you remember the maximum hoop stress uh, for breakouts to develop is that uh, the Kirsch equation term, which is the maximum tangential stress, be equivalent or more than the, the compressive strength of the rock. If you solve this question for the PW, which is the mud weight, it gives you the uh, basically collapse gradient, right? The mud weight that is needed uh, to support the rock, to avoid any breakouts development, right? So that's the term for what we call it collapse gradient, right? Some uh, in some uh, basically uh, literatures, you might see shear failure gradient instead of collapse gradient. They're the same thing. So then the, to calculate the collapse gradient, good estimation of the stresses are needed. You need to have pore pressure, right? Uh, <clears throat> thermal stress if needed, and then uh, failure envelope of the material, which this CS term comes from that. Let's talk about the frag gradient. Again, 
In this case, the minimum hoop strength should be less than the tensile strength of the material to develop those little, you know, tensile fractures. Again, we solve the equations for uh, mud weight and frag gradient equivalent or more than uh, three SH mean as, uh, minus SH max plus the pore pressure minus thermal stress minus tensile strength. So again, uh, fracture initiation is a, a mod weight that uh, is required to initiate tensile fractures on the world war wall, right? So again, I want to uh, magnify here is that uh, fracture gradient is, is a near world war phenomenon. It, is, it depends on the near world war parameters, you see? And it's calculated because a lot of people in the industry out there, they, they just assume fracture uh, gradient is equivalent to such, uh, such mean, right? Uh, but now you, you see that it's, it's not correct. It's, it's not a correct assumption, okay? So to calculate fracture gradient, good estimation of the stresses, <clears throat> pore pressure, temperature, and tensile strength is required. So if you uh, assume that uh, tensile strength is zero, it means that you are assuming that there are already existing fractures on the, in the formation, so you don't need to create one. And solving this equation with uh, T equal to zero, it gives you a fracture, uh, the fracture reopening gradient. This is the most conservative, basically, frag gradient. Uh, and typically, we, we suggest that to, to our clients because uh, this one is quite risky. It means if you slightly pass this frag gradient, you will uh, definitely initiate a fracture. Uh, but here, I mean, considering there are always existing fractures in the subsurface environment, is a very safe, basically, assumption to, to always uh, assume uh, tensile strength of zero. OK, uh, now. Imagine we did the, the wellbore stability analysis for a given mod weight, right? And we saw that, you know, uh, actually the hoop stress sinusoid is passing the breakout. So it means that we are, uh, we are putting the formation in the risk of collapse. How, how we can basically uh, fix this, uh, this, this situation, right? So all we can do is changing the mod pressure, right? By changing, by increasing the mud pressure, what we do, we are making the, the more circles smaller. It means we reduce the risk of being in the uh, failure, basically above the failure envelope. And in terms of hoop stress, we, are, we push the, the sinusoid down by increasing the, uh, the, the mud weight, right? But from the other side, we are putting the, the well, the risk of now fracturing. So, Optimization of the mud weight is avoiding any of these problems. We don't want this one. We don't want the green one. We want this yellow one, right? So we see we can we can play with the mud weight to basically come up with the optimal mud. We talk about the vertical well, which is quite easy uh, with respect to equations and solving the the problem. But uh, we are dealing with a lot of you know deviated wells and horizontal wells as well. In a more you know, uh, generic form, uh, we need to actually go from uh, a vertical and horizontal uh, coordination to a coordination that uh, is aligned with the axis of the well, right? So we go from X, Y, Z, uh, basically uh, from uh, horizontal vertical coordination to arbitrary coordination. And you already know from the theory section that it is just a matter of, you know, uh, tensile trans transform to go from one orientation to another one. So here, if we are in a principal stress condition, in this situation, we are not in principal stress condition anymore. So we have to calculate the shear components as well. But it's all about equations, right? It's, it's nothing complex there. So it means that we have uh, equations to calculate all the uh, normal and shear components of a, a stress tensor. Uh, but the main inputs to these equations, apart from the principal stresses, which are SV, uh, SH max, and SH min here, we also need some, uh, you see there are some uh, ge geometrical parameters, right? These L parameters. Where they are coming from, all of them depends on two geometrical parameters, deviation and azimuth of the well, okay? Which definitely we have them. So we have this, we have the, the principal stress uh, 
uh, data so we can calculate basically uh, a stress tensor at any well bore trajectory, okay? And uh, in these cases, instead of one sinusoid for the uh, hoop stress, we have two. We have the maximum, tangenti max maximum tangential stress and minimum tangential stress. And as you can imagine, um, to analyze the breakouts, we go for the maximum tangential. Uh, to analyze the fracturing condition, we have to look at the minimum tangential, right? So here is the wellbore stability definition in an arbitrary, basically, wellbore trajectory. This is an actual example. So uh, the way we calculate the frac gradient and collapse gradient here is, is uh, slightly different from uh, the previous case. Vertical well is more complex, but again, we have all the solutions. Uh, and uh, as you see, I mean, all these parameters depends on the, uh, the sinusoid. All of them changes with wellbore trajectory with I and A. Ge uh, geometry factors. So it clearly says that, you know, uh, frag gradient uh, and also collapse gradients are, are sensitive to well trajectory. It changes with, with wellbore trajectory. It means you, if you change the trajectory of the well, sometimes you can make the wellbore stability situation better, or sometimes you make it worse. So it's, it's a very important uh, factor to understand, right? So, my important message here is that both shear failure and fracture gradient, as I said, are trajectory dependent. Please do not develop these models for a vertical well and copy and paste them to a deviated or horizontal well. That's, that's the biggest mistake that industry is doing actually these days. Uh, uh, and this is actually a typical um, exercise among a uh, big part of our geomechanics and you know, PPFG community, they, uh, they ignore this this trajectory effect. So uh, I want to review the uh, workflow for 1D geomechanical modeling and wellbore stability study one more time, just to make sure that you guys understand that. As I mentioned, we typically start with the rock property modeling and we start with dynamic elastic constant modeling because all we need here is the dipole sonic log and density log, and then we can use uh, rock physical equations to uh, calculate this. Uh, uh, elastic properties. Then we have to convert them to a static <coughs> elastic constant. <coughs> Excuse me. Uh, these are the, the constant that are uh, comparable with, the, uh, with what we measure in the lab, right? But uh, lab, if you remember, they don't provide continuous profile for these pro uh, properties. So we use log-based properties we convert them to a static, but to do that, we need to have some measurements uh, of Young's modulus Poisson ratio in the lab, right? Then the next step is log-based uh, UCS estimation. UCS is the uniaxial compression strength of the rock. Uh, we need to calibrate this log-based model with the lab measurement. Uh, then we, all, uh, we need uh, a friction angle and cohesion uh, to be able to develop the failure envelope. To do this type of modeling, again, we do log-based modeling, but we need calibration uh, to triaxial test result from the lab. Next step is vertical stress calculation uh, using density log, then uh, pore pressure prediction. It can be actually the opposite. You can start with pore pressure and then go to vertical stress. But all these parameters, rock properties, vertical stress, and pore pressure are input for horizontal stress modeling, including the minimum horizontal stress modeling. Um, you know, again, where, where, where we have uh, log-based methodologies, but they need to be calibrated to the fracture closure pressure measured from uh, mini frags from uh, extended leak of test. Then maximum horizontal stress modeling, uh, which includes both direction of maximum stress and uh, magnitude. <clears throat> we just talked about that this session. Uh, now we are done with 1D geomechanical modeling. Uh, from this point <clears throat> upward, we are basically doing well by stability. So if thermal stress is important, we include that, we calculate that, otherwise we just ignore it. We assume that the tensile strength of the material is zero to be conservative. Then we calculate the frac gradient using uh, hoop stress equations. Uh, we calculate the collapse gradient using those equations. And uh, 
frag gradient is typically calibrated to uh, fracture reopening pressure or uh, fracture propagation pressure from the extended Likov test. Uh, and Collapse gradient is typically calibrated with the uh, borehole failures like breakouts and tensile, uh, breakouts basically. So there's the overall workflow. Now let's see what, what are the results that we get out of the well world stability study. <clears throat> this is a very nice example of a project. <clears throat> uh, this plot is called measure depth versus days. So it is kind of planning for drilling uh, community. Uh, they typically plan their, their drilling. They, they say, okay, this is our plan. This is how we want to uh, drill. Uh, I'm talking about this uh, black curve. But when they actually go ahead and drill because of a lot of unseen uh, issues and uh, problems, which some of them are operational, some of them are related to uh, geomechanical issues, not providing the, uh, enough mud weight for the formations, typically there's, there's, there are a lot of delays, right? Depends on how accurately we basically plan the well. So as you see, this well uh, specifically had about uh, 40, I mean, 50 days of delay which is a quite large, basically non-productive time involved. And it was mainly because of, uh, you know, wellbore collapse problem. You see, you see there, there are stock problems, there are loss circulation problem, there are requirements for side tracks three times, which is a killing factor. So it means that they didn't have any clue about uh, collapse gradient. So what we did, we, we, we basically developed a proper mud weight window, uh, developed a collapse gradient for them, we plan the well again for the next basically uh, uh, upcoming well. And uh, we changes the mud weight pr program and we changed the, the, the casing, basically shoes. As you see, there are different casing shoes because with geomechanical data, we can optimize the, all these parameters, right? <clears throat> they drilled the next well and they did even better than the, than the plan. So they, they saved five days uh, uh, in compared with the, with the plan. So see, we are talking about 55 days, right? Which uh, considering, in, I mean, in an onshore well and uh, probably which is much cheaper than the onshore drilling uh, is a huge amount of money uh, saved for the, for the operator. This one, this, 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 this is what geomechanics is doing. It's not, it's not a miracle, it's science. One, one output of the geomechanical modeling is that uh, if, you use, if you use a certain mud weight, what would be your, uh, the geometry of, the, your, of your well? So it's very important for logging, for uh, cement volume calculations, uh, and many other basically completion design <coughs> applications. Uh, the major output of uh, wellbore stability is the mud weight window, safe operation, operation mud weight window, right? So where to keep the mud weight <clears throat> to have a safe operations, to not, uh, not to get you know, kicks, not to get a uh, collapse related problem and not to frack the formation, right? This green section here is where your basically mud weight can be to have a safe drilling. The next output is basically to optimize the well trajectory. You remember that frack gradients uh, and Collapse gradients are both uh, related to, I mean, uh, sensitive to the wellbore trajectory, right? These polar plots, I don't know if you're familiar with them, but uh, what we can do, we can easily, th these are the plots that geologists use to, to show fractures and faults. In drilling, uh, we use them to show wellbore trajectories. For example, this well here is a vertical well, right? Because if you drill a vertical well at the center of this, uh, basically it's a sem semi-hemisphere, uh, I mean, then, Projection on the surface is the, is the center of the circle, right? Horizontal wells are basically any points on the edges of the circle. And other well trajectories like inclin uh, inclined wells are within this basically circle, right? Basically, you can show any wellbore trajectories with these polar plots. What geomechanics adds to these plots are this bunch of colors. But color mean a lot and they provide a lot of valuable information. For example, this plot on the left is color coded to the collapse gradient. And it's telling me that if I want to drill a vertical well, uh, the minimum mud weight I need is 14.1. Is but if I drill a horizontal well in this orientation, like south uh, uh, east, I need only 8.7. How if I drill a horizontal well at the northeast, again, we need about 14. 
you see, they're, they're both horizontal wells, but the required mud weight for them is, is extremely different. We can color code it to frag gradient, like what you see here. So what, what, is, what is it telling me? It's, it's telling me that the best, basically the easiest trajectory to drill with respect to uh, uh, mud weight window in this formation is basically a horizontal well to the east south. It might not be something that drillers want because they might want to drill some, I mean, maybe they miss the reservoir, right? But it, it just provide them insight, right? Yeah. If you don't miss your reservoir going from a vertical well to a deviated well, which is like uh, 30 degree, it makes your drilling easier, but you know, uh, geomechanics wise, but uh, it might be actually cheaper to drill uh, vertical well, right? So geomechanics provide a lot of insight with respect to the subsurface formations. But again, there are a lot of operational factors coming on top of it to basically maximize uh, or optimize the, the drilling design, right? But these are type of outputs that help uh, drillers to basically come up with the best uh, trajectory for drilling. So this is an example that, you know, uh, the tr uh, traditional people basically develop uh, what they call the PPFG model, <clears throat> and they come up with this uh, suggested mud weight, right? When we did proper uh, well bore stability modeling from Jim Kang side of uh, uh, point of view, we added this, this red line. And now you can see that if, if we follow the recommended mud weight in this first interval, almost 50% of the <clears throat> interval will collapse. So it's not really the optimum mud. The optimum mud should be somewhere in this narrow green window. Uh, this is an example of you know, uh, uh, an operator that uh, uh, drilled six wells uh, in, in, a, in a field in different, actually, different trajectories, uh, including horizontal, deviated, and vertical. And they lost basically three wells, right? Because they were using two low mud weights. So when I say lost, they had problems, actually. Some of them, maybe they didn't even get the target, but they, they, they had problematic drilling. And th these colors that we put uh, on top of this basically uh, wells later after the drilling was just to show them now how they did. For example, here, the plots are showing that, for example, in this case, uh, sorry, in this case, <clears throat> we need uh, something around now 10.5 PPG mod, but they did 9.8. This is why they got problem. Um, they were successful here because the mod width is non non point. Eight, but they actually could drill with, with something lower than that, close to nine. Uh, but anyway, it was good. So they lost 50% of their wells because they didn't have these colors, which comes from geomechanics. We talked about underbalanced drilling, right? Uh, this is the result of a study that we did for a case in uh, northern Iraq. <clears throat> the client wanted to do underbalance. So we showed that uh, now the condition is that uh, if you remember that the collapse gradient should be lower than pore pressure. So as you see clearly, the collapse gradient in it now with shaley silt, silt stone section on top of the reservoir, which was the carbonate, is significantly above the pore pressure. So the answer is a big no for underbalanced drilling. But in reservoir, actually, is possible because the rocks are strong. So they didn't listen to us. They drilled the well, and this is the result. A lot of huge cavings. Uh, stop them from drilling. They're actually, uh, what happens here, the nuclear uh, tool uh, got to stuck in the well and they couldn't actually recover that. Uh, they had to do fishing for, for about three months here. Okay, so we don't want to see this in our wells, of course. And then the last uh, uh, part of wellbore stability model is to validate uh, the model. For example, if we have a wellbore stability model that predicts some uh, synthetic, you know, um, uh, basically uh, creates a synthetic caliper log, which are basically the breakouts that predict, predicted by the model, they should correspond to the drilling incidents, right? Like loss circulations, like uh, basically the, uh, a good wellbore stability model is a model that predicts the, the experience that uh, has been already faced in offset wells, right? So if the model doesn't really uh, simulate that, it means uh, the model is not good. We have to go back and fix some of the parameters that we, we know that they have large uncertainties. Uh, another source of you know, a validation is to actually uh, create synthetic uh, caliper log by the model and compare it with the 
with the actual caliper. <clears throat> and the best way is to actually create synthetic image log and then compare it with the actual uh, breakouts that have been observed on the image log, right? The, these red ones are in, uh, breakouts with uh, developed by the, basically predicted by the model. And these blue ones are the one that uh, have, been, have been observed on the image log. So as you see, there's actually good match between the model and the field. So this model is a good model. And then uh, the last uh, topic uh, I want to discuss is, is I go faster. This, this is the shape of the cavings uh, that you get out of the well. If you are an operation <clears throat> geologist at the well site, these shapes actually give you some information about the type of failures down there. If you remember from poor pressure uh, sections, splintery shape uh, cavings typically correspond to the high uh, poor pressure zone, right? But if uh, the shapes are more angular, uh, they are more related to the shear failure of the formations. Uh, so it, it means the collapse uh, basic gradient issue is there. And if they are platy like this, it's the same problem they are due to shear failure, but from an, an isotropic formation, because we have, uh, we see the uh, basically an isotropic surfaces here clearly. So uh, you see, you can get a lot of information geologic wise or geomechanic wise, uh, uh, they provide you a lot of information. Some more examples here. Some more examples here. And I think we, uh, I don't, yeah, these are again some more examples of uh, splintery, platy, and blocky cavings. And these are typically chemical instability because you see the, the high clay, clay content in the uh, in the cavings, so it is more related to chemical. Uh, reactivation of shale when it's uh, imposed to the to the water. With that said, uh, uh, I'm done with the course, uh, and uh, I hope you enjoyed it. I hope you you learned something useful, and uh, I'm open to actually answer any, any questions if we have time. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. The session was very informative and clear. We have collected some questions. I hope we can cover most of them. Sure. Yeah, my pleasure. Uh, first question, which software do we use to build well bore stability models? Uh, there are several uh, software out there. I don't really want to advertise or promote any of those softwares. Uh, but to be honest, uh, based on my experience, no single software can do all the jobs that you want. Uh, I mean, I typically combine uh, two, three softwares from the different providers to, to do an appropriate job, right? But let, let, let me not mention any software name. You can easily Google and, and find the software names. Uh, OK. Uh, apart of geomechanic, uh, is there other technologies to uh, ident identify the well-bore problems? Uh, so, sorry, can you repeat the question? I didn't catch it. Uh, apart of geomechanics, is there other technologies to identify the well-bore problems? No, identifying wellbore problem is not is not the problem because you will notice. I mean, all those indicators, all those problems that I just mentioned in, in one of the slides, you 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 easily identify them during drilling, right? But if if the question is that is there any other technologies than geomechanics yes. to to solve this problem, the answer is no. You need to understand the 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 rock formation, the mechanical properties, and uh, mechanical reaction of the rocks to the, to the drilling uh, operation. Okay, someone is asking, asking is there any other method, method to calculate over bridging stress apart of density log? Uh, I mean, density is the, the most important uh, parameters to calculate the basically <clears throat> vertical stress because it's the, the dead weight of the you know, overburden. So if you don't have density, you can look at the cuttings and cavings, right? Like this, these features coming out of the well and try to measure their density, right? Like in different intervals, every 10 meters, every 200 meters and make an average and use that as, as the log, right? Uh, you can also look at the uh, tables, for example, if you're drilling in shale and you, you know is a specific type of shale, you can look at the tables and come up with an average uh, basically density for it. But you know, the, the most accurate uh, vertical stress profiles uh, 
are calculated when you have you no know, density lock. But I understand the concern because typically you don't get density lock in the overburden. You get it in the uh, in the uh, reservoir. There are also methodologies to create synthetic density lock from uh, sonic lock, uh, which petrophysicists typically uh, use. I mean, you, you can Google that as well and you see there, there are many actually papers on those uh, methodologies. Okay, someone is asking if the mud weight window is too narrow, what is the, uh, what is the best solution to do in this case? Uh, from technology-wise, is MPD, manage pressure drilling. Sometimes you have to actually go that direction. If you don't want to uh, get a stock in the well, uh, manage pressure drilling is this one of the best uh, methodologies. But another technology which uh, is also very effective, especially if, if there is no window. In these cases, even MPD doesn't work. We have drilling with casing. So you, you, casing the well, you case the well as you drill. But scientifically, from geomechanics point of view, I mean, except changing the trajectory that might help or might not, there's no other solution, right? If, if geomechanics says no, there's no window, you have to look for technology. Okay, next question. What is the difference between dipole log and density log? Dipole sonic log measures the, the travel times. Density log measures the density. There are two different, you know, physical properties. Uh, I don't know if uh, I, I'm not sure if the, the answer is clear. Uh, I mean, the question is clear. But there are two totally different uh, physical properties that are measured by two different uh, logging tools. Uh, next question: A question: uh, How can we use the exponent to predict geomechanics? Yeah, D exponent is actually a, a log calculated from uh, different drilling parameters. Uh, we typically can, uh, can treat it as a log specifically for pore pressure prediction and uh, follow the same, the same methodologies that we actually apply to, a, for example, resistivity log to get pore pressure. <clears throat> for geomechanical purposes, it means rock property, uh, we can also, I mean, I, I, we don't really look at the exponent, but there is a, a, a similar uh, log, which is called uh, mechanical specific energy, right? It is a more inclusive uh, type of parameters that uh, look at uh, more drilling parameters actually uh, are involved in that. Uh, MSC can, can be, mechanical specific energy can be used to basically predict uh, uh, rock properties. Uh, we have actually uh, an IP technology in petrol and that we can get uh, all rock properties plus uh, all the stresses from drilling parameters, right? Without requirement for any locks. Yeah, but um, it was a good question. Yeah, we can do that. Okay, next question. Uh, which kind of failure is, is splinter? Splinter is, is extensile uh, uh, failure mechanism. It's is type of... Uh, tensile failure, actually, is under the tensile failure. If you go to the uh, theory section, you, you will see one slide for extensile, <clears throat> basically, uh, failure. And the last question, can you please explain the effects of trebbing and remaining time on uh, WPS, will poor stability? Uh, I'm not sure if I get the question. The effect of tripping and rimming on the and remaining time on okay. WPS. Uh, and there is usually short remaining time. That means we will have tight spot while POH and casing stuck while running casing. Yes. So what, what? Okay, I understood the second part. What I don't understand is the first part of the question. He, he, he is asking, can you please explain the effects of trapping and remaining time on wellbore stability? You know, I think the question is opposite. What is the effect of wellbore stability on, on tripping Maybe. time? Because we do wellbore stability to minimize the, the time, the non-productive time that sometimes you have to basically, uh, when you get a stock in the world, when, when you, uh, your bit is packed off, uh, you have to do actually a lot of extra rimming and uh, uh, several extra trips to basically condition the well. 
So it increases the time of drilling, the time of uh, 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 tripping, if we don't do well bore stability. So one of the objective of well bore stability is to minimize this time. I don't know if I, I gave the right answer. Great, that's all for today. Thank you, Dr. Hamid. It was an honor to have a course with you. We really appreciate your valuable time and your efforts. Thank and you very much, my you pleasure. All. Thank you, everyone. The lecture, will, the lecture will be uploaded to PyPetri YouTube channel, and don't forget to solve the quiz on Google Classroom. And a quick reminder, the final exam will be this Thursday, February 7. As usual, we offer three exams with different times. First exam at 2 p.m., second at 8 p.m., and third at, at 2 a.m. next day, all in Egypt time. And please take only one exam. Choose the best time for you. Best of luck and thank you again.